Hey folks, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. So welcome to part two of a multi-part video series where I restore a 12-inch Newtonian telescope. In part one, I did a teardown. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. In this video, we're going to build it back better. And specifically, we're going to concentrate on five improvements. We're going to resurface the OTA outside and in. We're going to flock in front of the primary mirror. We're going to flock opposite the focuser. We're going to clean the mirrors, both primary and secondary. And then we're going to implement an aperture mask that blocks the reflections from those mirror clips that are in the primary mirror housing. I think that these are really simple improvements that you can make to your Newtonian that will result in a better performing telescope. And if you are into astronomy and all things astrophotography, go ahead, subscribe. I really would appreciate it and I think you'll love the channel. So with that, let's go ahead and start this rebuild process. Let's go ahead and start by resurfacing the OTA, and we're going to do both inside and out. Now, this is a dirty job. It generates a ton of dust, so I'm going uh, to do the work in my tractor bay uh, with my protective gear. And uh, we are ultimately going to want the inside of the OTA to be as black as possible. Um, uh, but you also see me working on the outside of the tube. I do that because I... I'm making this instrument my own and the more that I put into these types of projects the more pride I take in the outcome and that tends to lead to better discipline and better outcomes in my imaging sessions and uh, so at any rate um, you know the outside of this well the tube itself is steel it's not aluminum and it was painted not powder coated from the factory and clearly there's some dents some scratches and oh, about 10 years worth of grime so uh, I used a 100 grit and then 180 grit sandpaper to to basically take off that outer layer of paint smooth it out and there's no real need to go down to bare metal but I, you know I like to see some of the metal I'm careful to get all the dust off the tube in the surrounding area using my air compressor and then I'll use a tack cloth you know just to really wipe it down and, and make sure that there's nothing uh, left on the tube before I go to the, to the uh, primer and I, I'm just gonna use a, uh, sp a spray can uh, rust-oleum kind of um, uh, flat gray primer uh, to uh, put a protective coat on the steel which is looking pretty good so I opted for this spa blue, uh, which is this kind of baby blue, and I love it. And uh, the runner-up was this green ivy paint, but I decided spa blue. And uh, obviously, I want to get all the painting, uh, all the major paint work done outside and before I go to the inside of the OTA, just to avoid any contamination of spray uh, on the final coats of black that will be applied inside the tube. And I have to say, the blue looks great. Okay, so on to the inside of the OTA. Um, obviously, we want the inside of this tube to be as flat black as possible. This is to minimize internal reflections of light. We really want as much of the signal that's going to reach the sensor or the eyepiece to be that of the object that we're observing or imaging. And there are lots of shiny little parts inside the OTA. And um, at any rate, I used the uh, flat black from Ace Hardware. Um, as my starting point and you know just kind of carefully go around and and, and coat the inside of the tube uh, you can see the difference between what has been painted and what uh, has not been painted but you know in the end you know, I have to tell you that I, I think this is one of those areas that we obsess over and I'm not a, I, I'm not a hundred percent certain you know, how critical your choice of paint is here. There are folks that will scream that the ultra flat from Krylon is the best. And I've seen other people who have done studies that say that there's no difference between that and the Ace Hardware uh, flat black. In the end, I wasn't happy with any of it. You know, I lowered a blinking flashlight into the OTA and I don't know, it, was, it could be that the paint wasn't fully dry, but I really felt like there was a lot of internal reflections there and that flat black is very difficult to, uh, to achieve with any paint. And in fact, that's what made me decide that I'm going to selectively flock the inside of the tube uh, in two strategic areas. 
for flocking, I am using some black velvet with uh, an adhesive back that I purchased on Amazon. Uh, the roll is about 117 inches long and about 17.5 inches in width, and you can see it here. There are specialty flocking uh, materials and companies that specialize in it, but um, for now, this is a good place for me to start. To flock or not to flock is the question. There are advantages and disadvantages to, to flocking. I think the advantage is that, you know, it is going to give you a very black and uh, flat uh, finish, and I, and I think that um, it is probably much less reflective, and is less reflective than paint. The drawback is that it is an adhesive back, and um, that adhesive uh, can wear out and obviously give way, causing the flocking material to lift off the tube. Uh, dust and other debris can also get stuck onto the, the velvet or velour surface. This is not the end of the world, um, but uh, you know, flocking may involve certain maintenance activity. You know, I decided to use it strategically. I took care of just in front of the primary mirror. I laid down a 17 and a half inch strip, and you see me working that here. Uh, it's a little tricky. I mean, um, you know, if you've never <laughs> worked inside of a, a you know a, a 14 inch diameter tube and reached in there and kind of make sure everything is square, and that as you're kind of pulling the protective tape off the back, you're properly kind of uh, setting the flocking material squarely in place, working around the inner diameter of the tube. This is a little bit challenging, but you know, be patient and, you, and you'll get it right. And, and don't be too concerned if you have a few creases in there. You can, number one, you can always work those creases down uh, little by little just by rubbing it. Um, and kind of work out the creases but even if you have creases in there it's really not a bad thing um, in fact you know I ultimately wanted to do baffling in this uh, tube which really is probably the best protection against uh, reflection so think of your creases as irregular baffles and and they're actually very very small so at any rate I did I did decide to flock in front of the primary mirror and I also flocked directly opposing the focus so those are the areas where you know reflections I really want to mitigate any reflections um, and um, and I think that uh, uh, the, the, the flocking material is a better choice than than paint okay it's on to probably the most important improvement here which is cleaning these filthy mirrors take a look at the primary and the secondary here absolute mess and uh, in order to clean these I need to uh, free the primary mirror from the uh, mirror cell and uh, turns out that uh, the mirror was once uh, removed from the mirror cell in the past and uh, whoever replaced it uh, decided to use some adhesive um, to have the mirror stick to the mirror cell now this is uh, not an uncommon practice but really shouldn't be necessary and it does make the removal of the primary mirror a little bit more challenging you got to be careful as you work it kind of work that adhesive those adhesive pads off the back of the mirror and uh, without you don't want to chip it you don't want to drop it uh, all sorts of things can all nasty things can happen so anyway I did uh, manage to get the primary mirror free from the housing and uh, of course uh, I have some extra work to do here to uh, clean up the triangles in the uh, mirror housing and to clean the back of the mirror and replace that with some just basic uh, some felt pads And it was down to the kitchen where I was able to clean them. And I cleaned them in the kitchen sink. And uh, all you really need here is some running water and a drop of dish soap. And um, very gently, just kind of, uh, you know, move your fingers across the surface of the mirror while the water is running on it. You don't want to rub hard. You just want to kind of just allow... Uh, slight contact with your finger to kind of free the debris and you'll be amazed at uh, how how well this works and what I also do is I have a bottle which is 50% uh, uh, alcohol and 50% water distilled water 
it's actually purified water. And uh, when I'm done uh, cleaning the mirror, I, th I just generously spray it with this mixture. And I find that that allows for it to dry without uh, spotting. And uh, that's all there really is to it. You know, don't make mirror cleaning more complicated than it needs to be. And look at the uh, net result of this. See, these mirrors are, you know, they have a couple pitting points. And, uh, you know, that's to be expected. They're old mirrors. Uh, but they're actually pretty clean. And I think they're going to serve this telescope uh, well. So we'll see when we get it out there into the observatory. So in that last image, you'll notice that the primary mirror was reassembled into the mirror cell, into the housing, but there was a black ring around the uh, mirror, and that is an aperture mask that uh, I created from my uh, laser cutting machine, and basically it's made of uh, basswood, um, and uh, I did some measuring. Uh, and the idea here is to simply mask off the outer edge of the mirror up to the point of where the clips uh, were showing. And this is really just uh, to prevent those clips from creating unnecessary diffractions um, uh, in your imaging train. And, you know, there's a, a pluses and minuses to this. The pluses are that if there are diffractions that occur uh, because of those clips, which I believe are more likely because these clips are not necessarily finished in a flat black, um, well, this will eliminate that. The drawback is that um, sometimes people use those three clips as a mechanism for rough collimation to make sure that their secondary mirror is properly aligned um, uh, with respect to the primary mirror. Uh, but I find that with a centering ring in the mirror that I have, a little centering dot, that uh, the three clips are really are, are not are, are not uh, are not necessary for me to orient uh, the secondary relative to the primary. Now this retaining ring replaces the shims that are normally on top of these clips. And uh, remember that when you do uh, tighten down the clips onto the face of the mirror, you do not want to over tighten. You really should be able to move a piece of paper in between the mirror and the and the clips. And uh, don't worry, you know, I know I touched the mirror a couple times with my fingers, uh, but uh, I am going to do a final alcohol spray on this and uh, before we set it back into the OTA. And that is one clean mirror sitting securely in its cell. So I installed the primary mirror before the secondary. And um, to do this, um, I kind of reversed the process that uh, I use when I tear it down. So I place a couple of pallet boards on the floor. Um, I set the primary mirror on the floor and then I attempt to lower the OTA with the housing screw holes aligned. Sometimes that can be difficult and really this should be done with two people. The other alternative is to try to put the primary mirror uh, housing, insert that while the tube is uh, standing upright where the mirror is on the top of the tube. The risk here, of course, is that your primary mirror falls out of its housing and uh, becomes damaged. Uh, needless to say, I'm uncomfortable with this approach, um, but happily I got this done and I got the telescope up onto the bench as quickly as possible. So I also um, did some touch up on things like the clamshells, uh, clamps, I, I painted those, I cleaned everything thoroughly, the focuser in particular. This is a uh, linear bearing Crayford uh, focuser with uh, uh, a 10x um, and two speeds. Uh, we'll see how that holds up. I decided not to install the Telrad at this time. Instead, I went to the finder scope. And I have to tell you, the scope looks awesome. I, I really am looking forward to calibrating it and uh, collimating it and getting it out into the observatory.
And definitely with these five improvements, we have built this thing back better. Okay, folks, let's call that a wrap for now. I hope you guys are enjoying this uh, video series on restoring this Newtonian. I'm absolutely enjoying the work effort itself. So in the next video, we're going to precisely collimate this telescope and we're going to set it up with an imaging train. And that's going to include a filter wheel, an autofocuser, and a camera choice. And once we have that, we're going to deploy it to the observatory and get it ready for first light. So with that, I'm going to see everybody on the next video.